Hello folks, and welcome to Tea Story Time, where we cover history, urban legends, paranormal happenings, and everything in between. Today, we're kicking off a new series, our History Of series, where we talk about places both significant and obscure, and what their past, present, and possibly even what their future are going to look like. Now, today's topic was inspired by a place I'd rather be at. See, right now in Michigan, it's cold and snowy, at least when I'm writing this, and frankly, I prefer a tropical climate. Because of this, we're going to be taking a tour of one of America's most beautiful and unique destinations, Key West. And we're going to take a deep dive into its history, leading to the present day, where we're going to discuss what it's like on this little tropical island just barely resting above the ocean floor. If you'd like to skip to a future part of this video, I've listed on the description on the little red bar at the bottom of the video, some chapters, so feel free to scroll around if you'd rather hear about one thing over another. Anyways, if you're inclined, comment the place that I should cover next and maybe even consider subscribing. Otherwise, lean back in your desk chair and take a sip of that refreshing pina colada, because we're visiting paradise today, folks. Now, obviously, the Keys weren't always saturated by Western influence, and before the Spanish arrived, the islands were inhabited by the native people of the region, named the Calusa and the Tequesta. These folks lived in the Keys region in large part because there was an abundance of food to eat, such as fish, lobsters, turtles, and more, and because of raw materials that were abundant in the region. Now, when the Spanish did arrive at what is today Key West, with Ponce de Leon discovering it in his search for the Fountain of Youth in North America, he referred to it as Cayo Hueso, or the Island of Bones, which was only one small part of the island chain we know as the Keys today, that Ponce de Leon referred to as Los Martiras, or the Martyrs in English, named because he felt that the islands looked like men in distress. Now the name Cayo Hueso, or the Island of Bones, was given to Key West because Prior to Spanish arrival, the island was actually used as a graveyard by the Calusa natives, and according to the Spanish, when they arrived on the island, it was littered with bones because of this. Now, after the Spanish staked their claim on the island, as the Spanish did, admittedly, there was not much to write home about that occurred here. There are a few documented skirmishes with pirates dwelling on Key West, but otherwise, the historical accounts of the island are unremarkable. Additionally, there are reports that Cubans and Bahamians were fishing and catching turtles in the region, and that privateers would dwell in the Keys when they were lying low. Now in 1764, Great Britain took control of Florida from Spain, eventually in 1766 leading to Eastern Florida's British governor suggesting to fellow officials that they sell up a military post on Key West to maintain their control over the area, given, as I said, the Bahamians were known to set up long-standing settlements on the island. Now, nothing did happen here, and from what I can tell, the British never did establish any permanent settlement on Key West, despite the governor's desire. And eventually, in 1783, Great Britain returned Florida, including the Keys, to the Spanish. Yes, this is missing from Key West's Wikipedia page, and yes, I will be updating the page soon to reflect this. Now, a while after the Keys were returned to Spanish control, the Spanish governor of Cuba deeded the island of Key West to Juan Pablo Salas, an officer of the Royal Spanish Navy that was posted in St. Augustine, Florida, which is where things started heating up in terms of Key West's history. See, soon after this deeding in 1819, Spain ceded Florida to the United States. And this was all finalized upon the ratification of the adams onis Treaty in 1821, which officially gave control of Florida to the United States. Now this next part is a bit confusing, so bear with me. Even though West Florida, East Florida, and the Florida Keys were all American territories now, the American government was still recognizing property transactions that occurred during Spanish ownership, albeit only if there was documentation to prove it. Key West was one of the few islands that fell into this category, and this prompted Salas to sell Key West, and this also explains why he sold it, not just for a relatively low price, but also sold the island twice, first at a value of $575, and then at a value of $2,000, with the $2,000 buyer eventually coming out as the proper owner. This individual 
John W. Simonton, bought the island in January of 1822 in a cafe in Havana, Cuba. And admittedly, the first buyer, one General John Geddes, the former governor of South Carolina, did try to secure ownership of the island, but Simonton beat him to the punch because he had a bit more sway in Washington, D.C., allowing him to get the title to the island first. Now, Simonton was a USA businessman who generally operated out of Mobile, Alabama, and he was interested in the property because his friend John Whitehead, when stranded in the Keys following a shipwreck once, had noticed that they offered deep harbors, and after thinking about it, realized that the Keys were a strategic location from a military point of view. Some even referred to it as the Gibraltar of the West, in reference to its strategic positioning from a naval perspective. Now, John divided this island into four sections, and three of these sections he sold to the individuals John Mountain, John Fleming, and his once shipwrecked friend, John Whitehead. John Mountain quickly resold his portion of the island to one Pardon C. Green, who actually lived on the island. John Mountain is notable because he's one of the original purchasers, or founding fathers, as some say. He's also the only one that permanently lived there, and he briefly even served as Key West's mayor. John Whitehead also lived there for a little bit, for eight years, but then he moved away in 1832, only to visit once more in 1861 before quickly passing away. John Fleming, which I'm now just realizing is one of the four Johns involved in this story, sorry if this is a bit confusing, was a mercantile businessman in Mobile, Alabama, hence his relation to John Simonton, and only lived in Key West for a few months before moving to Massachusetts. He did return to Key West in the 1830s, hoping to develop salt manufacturing businesses, but sadly he passed away shortly after his visit too. Finally, John Simonton, the original purchaser, was a resident of Washington following this, but spent his winters in Key West and was a key figure in lobbying for the establishment of a naval stronghold on the island, both to reduce instances of piracy and to leverage the location of the island for naval strength. Now, convenient for the newly acquired island was that in 1825, the government passed the Federal Wrecking Act, allowing all wrecked ships in US waters to be taken to a USA port of entry, and then again, conveniently, in 1828, Key West became a port of entry, cementing what would be a cornerstone of its economy for years to come. See, Bahamians in the past often grabbed these wrecked ships for themselves, bringing them back to the Caribbean, but now they had to take them to Key West to auction them, leading to the wrecking industry becoming prominent in the region and contributing to the transition of Key West from an island graveyard to a thriving city. Now this might sound funny to you, given in modern day shipwrecks are fairly uncommon, but at the time shipwrecks occurred on a nearly weekly basis around Key West and this rate was speeding up with the popularity of the port. Now at this point in history, the USA railroad system wasn't yet developed, so the most cost-effective way to transport goods salvaged from the nearby wreckage and the reefs to Key West was by ship. Because of this, Key West quickly became valuable because of its location relative to the Gulf of Mexico and larger cities of the Northeast, actually briefly becoming the richest city per capita in the United States in the 1830s, due in part to the city becoming Florida's most important port city, handling up to 90% of territorial imports and exports. In 1836, all of this growth pushed the Army Corps of Engineers to ask Congress to provide funds to build a proper fort on the island. And this fort, Fort Taylor, named after a hero of the Mexican-American War, was opened in 1850, giving the Keys a strong military presence and demonstrating that the government indeed recognized the territory's importance to the country. In the 1850s, many Bahamians migrated to Key West, working as shipbuilders, fishermen, and other maritime professions, spurred on by the strong economy of Key West and its proximity to the Bahamas. This labor force was crucial to the advancement of the Keys, and they actually condensed in a neighborhood which is now between Whitehead Street and the military base, with this neighborhood becoming known as Bahama Village. Now we all know what happened in the 1860s. In 1861, when the Civil War started, Florida was one of the states to secede from the Union. But luckily for the Union, one Captain James Milton Brannan of the USA Army was a senior officer in Key West. And after Florida's secession, Brannan claimed Fort Taylor for the Union, 
making Key West a Union stronghold in South Florida. Additionally, under the authority of Abraham Lincoln himself, the writ of habeas corpus, or the requirement that a person arrested be brought to defend themselves against their crimes before a court, was suspended in Key West. And thus, any person considered dangerous to the USA on the islands, like Confederate soldiers and sympathizers, was threatened with removal from the island. Now, this didn't mean there weren't Confederate sympathizers on the island that ran their mouths, but for the most part, these sympathizers kept quiet because the Union affiliation benefited them economically. Additionally, the Keys had a large free black population that continued to grow during this conflict. Following Union control, with folks fleeing their masters and heading for Key West, where slaves were free people. Key West was a strategic point during the Civil War too, and enabled the Union to further limit the supplies going in and out of the Confederate States of America from the Gulf of Mexico. Weirdly, during this conflict, Key West's population actually grew, because in contrast to the rest of Florida, the Keys continued to thrive economically during the Civil War due to the sponging industry as well as the prominent shipping and salvaging industries in the area. And this brings us to Reconstruction. If you're familiar with this point in history, you'll be well aware that the South was struggling post-Civil War. But Key West was, as I've stated, in another boat. Because it was controlled by the Union during the whole conflict, as I said, it didn't really suffer economically like the rest of the Confederate States of America because it was still able to trade with Union allies and other Union cities. Additionally, another important event occurred for Key West in the 1860s and 1870s, with the outbreak of the Cuban Ten Years' War, which started in 1868 and, as you'd expect, lasted 10 years, which was one of Cuba's first fights for independence from Spain, essentially being started by wealthy Cuban natives. This event actually prompted lots of native Cubans to flee from Cuba northward, somewhat to Europe or more established American cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Boston, but the poorer Cubans generally made their way to Key West, and then eventually moved on to Tampa. See, here we're getting our first hints of what made Tampa Cigar City in the first place, but a little more on that later. What you need to know for now is that with the influx of Cubans came a Cuban economic activity, the manufacture of cigars to be precise, and Key West quickly became a hub for the production of Cuban cigars. Additionally, with this large influx of Cubans, Spanish became a near second language for the city of Key West, and the city even started to print a newspaper, El Republicano, in Spanish. Heck, in 1876, even one Cuban-born individual was elected as mayor of Key West, and there's a statue of him in the Key West Sculpture Garden to this day. His name was Carlos Manuel Cespedes. In addition to this, Cubans even represented Key West in the Florida legislature and as a county judge for the county that Key West is within. And with all of this in mind, let's step it back for a minute. Key West not only survived, but thrived through the trying times of the Civil War and Reconstruction, and even had a strong labor influx from the Ten Years' War. But changes were on the horizon, economically speaking. See, these days you barely hear about what was, at the time, one of Key West's most profitable activities, shipwrecking. And there's a reason for that. Our ability to navigate ships and our knowledge of the ocean have improved dramatically, and these improvements were starting to show their face in the 1870s, meaning there were less shipwrecks for the shipwrecking industry and the Keys to profit off of, shifting many of the salvagers in the region to being spongers, but this wasn't a cure-all. While the Keys were indeed a valuable port, they were also remote and getting the sponges from this island to the rest of the country was a bit pricey. However, the quality of the sponges was so high in the region that the industry continued to prosper for years to come, employing as many as 1,200 men at its peak. Regardless, even though Key West found a band-aid, it wasn't a cure. Additionally, it's worth noting that at the time, another valuable industry existed in the Keys to some extent. I have a question for you here. Where do you think folks in olden days got all of their salt? Well, one source was to harvest salt from receding tidal pools. Essentially, when tidal pools recede, they leave behind a bit of salt water. And as airflow dries up a tidal pool, it leaves behind salt crystals, which can be harvested by raking the sandy bed of a tidal pool. This industry was quite prominent in Key West, starting in the 1830s. But in the 1860s, when the Civil War started, there was chatter that some of this salt was being exported to the Confederate Florida mainland, 
So as you'd expect, the union presence on the island shut down the salting industry. Now this wasn't necessarily the death bell for the industry. Post-Civil War, it did restart at a limited capacity at least, but after a hurricane in 1876 messed with the tidal pools, the salt collecting industry ceased once again, this time for good. Now, remember how I said there were a lot of cigar factories in Key West that were started by the Cubans? Yeah, that was still the case in the early 1880s, but sadly, the migration of these factories to Tampa was on the horizon. See, in 1886, there was an event known as the Great Fire of Key West. This was, as you'd expect, a fire that destroyed much of the city in what was the most destructive fire in Key West history. The fire started in a coffee shop next to the San Carlos Institute, which is nowadays a Cuban heritage center, and this occurred just in time for a perfect storm of events to light the city aflame. In short, the Keys didn't have much of a fire department at the time. Sure, in 1875, the city did form a fire department, but the city's only fire engine was in New York being repaired, which is literally about a half a world away, leaving behind only hand pumps to push water onto fires. Additionally, on this day in 1886, March 30th to be precise, there were really strong winds, which kept reigniting the fire after it had been put out. Now, if you scroll through the internet, you'll find accounts that this fire could have been a Spanish conspiracy-fueled arson event spurred on by the support Key West offered Cuban immigrants. And it's true that these Cubans working in Key West did send quite a bit of money back to Cuba to support the revolution. And also additionally, it's true that following the fire, a Spanish ram arrived to pick up Cubans and take them back to Cuba, you know, if they wanted to return home after the cigar factories or other businesses had been destroyed. And also, perhaps the most suspicious, the Havana newspaper actually supposedly ran an article describing the Key West fire the day before it took place. Which, you know, makes you wonder if this was all planned out by the Cubans. Now, regardless, this fire of 1886 was extremely impactful, destroying 614 houses, 18 cigar factories, government warehouses, sponging warehouses, and put thousands out of work. This didn't necessarily dissuade the rebuilding of the city, luckily, though, and within a few years, the city was at least starting to look like a shell of the city that it once was. They also advanced their fire prevention and fighting systems substantially, purchasing a new steam engine, rebuilding the burnt-down firehouse, making a system to pump salt water, and making a fire alarm system throughout the city. As I said though, not everything would be as it once was after this fire, and one of the things in particular to note is that many of the owners of the burnt down cigar factories relocated them to Tampa after this, contributing in large part to its namesake, the Cigar City. Even with this fire's impacts though, Key West wasn't sunk. As I said, the booming sponge industry in the area was still very much alive, and the city held a monopoly on the sponging industry, delivering around 2,000 tons of sponges a year at its peak. From what I can tell, the sponging trade was the main theme of the 1890s in the Key West, helping its population increase to nearly 20,000, and making it the most populated city in Florida at the time. You'd hope that following the fire of 1886, that Key West had a bit of time off from disasters too, but sadly this wasn't the case, with the early 20th century being plagued by a variety of natural disasters that I guess you at least couldn't pin on the Spanish. The first of which was the 1909 Keys Hurricane. That struck the region, which to this day is one of the strongest in Key West history. By today's standards, it's estimated that this storm would have been about a Category 3 hurricane. This storm, after slamming into western Cuba, hit Key West, covering it with 8 hours and 14 inches of rain and strong winds, eventually destroying between 400 and 500 homes, a handful of churches, destroying roads, tearing down light poles, destroying nine more cigar factories, and damaging docks and boats. Just in 1909 currency, it was estimated that about $1 million in damages occurred from this weather event, and spurred martial law to be declared on the island. This hurricane was followed by another similar strength hurricane that wreaked havoc in 1910 too, causing less but substantial damages all the same of about $250,000 in 1910 money from ripping houses off of their foundations. Luckily, at least some good news was on the horizon for Key West. See, at this point, the island was, well, an island, and it was fairly isolated from mainland Florida and the rest of the Keys, with individuals having to travel there by boat. But this was about to change due to one notable individual. 
Henry M. Flagler. Henry Flagler was an American businessman who had founded a company named Standard Oil and was also the founder of Florida's East Coast Railway. He's also credited as the founder of the city of Miami. While sadly in 1912, Flagler only had about a year left to live, his legacy would be remembered in Key West as this was the year that Key West was connected to the mainland by an extension of the Henry M. Flagler Florida East Coast Railway which, from what I can tell, runs along the same area as today's roadways that pass from Miami through the Keys. This bit of railroad was referred to as the Overseas Railroad, and was essentially a 128 mile long extension of the existing Florida East Coast Railway. They started constructing the railway in 1905, and it became operational in the aforementioned year 1912. Now, once it was built, it was originally thought it would be a huge boon to the region economically, but to the disappointment of the railway and the cargo shipping industry through Key West, it didn't live up to what it was anticipated to be, generally transporting coal, fruit, and building materials, as well as fresh water. But the growth in shipping from cargo that passed through the Panama Canal that was recently built was underwhelming at best. This train network also transported people both within Florida and throughout the United States, with coach and sleeping car service transporting folks as far as New York City on a daily basis. Now these trains weren't exactly fast, and it's worth keeping in mind that the train ride back from Key West to Miami took about four to five hours, which for reference is about what it takes to drive between the two places these days. Following the development of the railway, despite its underwhelming reception from an economic point of view for the railway, there was a bit more bad news too. Once again, there was a hurricane in 1919 that ripped through the region, hitting the Florida Keys around September 9th of that year. The hurricane only caused about $25,000 of damages in 1919 dollars, but also ended the lives of about 600 to 900 folks, most of them being aboard 10 ships that were lost at sea during the storm. Additionally, this storm cut off communication to the Keys for days following the event, and while this all sounds bad, the scope of the damage to Key West wasn't nearly what it would be in 1935's Labor Day hurricane, which I'll describe soon enough. Following this, while Key West was starting to drop in population from its peak, which was in the 1900s and the 1910s, there was still economic activity ongoing and developing on the island. In 1926, for instance, Pan Am Airlines was founded in Key West by two U.S. Army Air Corps individuals who started to fly mail and passengers between Key West and Havana, Cuba. This operation expanded over the next few years to transport further to Central and South America, and eventually became a fairly dominant player in the U.S. airline industry. Additionally, during the 1920s, Key West saw a notable American guest pay the town a visit, Ernest Hemingway. In 1928, he visited, first intending to stay for a short while, but ended up loving it so much that he spent 11 years there, writing six whole books. Through the 1930s, he spent his winters in the Keys and his summers in Wyoming hunting, and he even ended up buying a home in Key West. He was also said to frequent Sloppy Joe's Bar in Key West, a bar that's still standing to this day. Now after this, he traveled quite a bit, moving to Cuba where he supposedly had about a dozen cats living on his property who were eventually brought to Key West. And it's said that the descendants of Hemingway's cats actually still dwell in his historic home, as designated the Ernest Hemingway House by the US National Register of Historic Places on the Island. Despite this prominent visitor and the formation of an airline though, Key West wasn't what it once was, and the city had fallen far from its powerful shipwrecking economy that made it the richest city per capita on the whole country just a century prior, and was now, even without the Great Depression looming, notably unwell economically. Ernest Hemingway himself had even referred to it as the Saint Tropez of the poor, in reference to the beautiful city along the French Riviera. When the Great Depression hit, this all compounded so dramatically that it created a permanent change on the tropical island. During the depression, Key West lost essentially all of its industry, most of its jobs, and about a third of its population, with some reports claiming that it was the hardest hit place in the country, suffering to the point that 80% of the over 10,000 citizens were on federal relief. The city couldn't even afford to staff a fire department, police officers, or sanitation services at the height of its despair. People were making ends meet by selling coconuts and selling sharks and other fish, and children were apparently diving into the water off of piers, searching the bottom of the ocean for coins tossed in by tourists. But lucky for Key West, a change was coming, 
and that change was called the New Deal. See, the squalor of Key West was so noticeable that it actually captured the attention of the whole nation. And on July 2nd of 1934, this led to the town surrendering its sovereignty to the state and allowing one Julius F. Stone, the Florida head of the Federal Emergency Relief Administration, to implement a relief program on the island. The general thought is that rather than simply paying the folks on the island or relocating them, Stone would put them to work to change Key West into a bustling tourist destination known the country over, making it a place to attract fishermen, tired businessmen, artists, and families the likes of Bermuda. Stone tasked many of the locals with offering 25 hours of their time per week as a volunteer workforce and put folks to work cleaning streets, repairing homes, and planting flowers. Additionally, some money was given to homeowners and charter boat owners to repair and refresh these establishments so that they could house guests and take them out into the ocean. Overall, over a million volunteer hours were recorded, and by the end of the Great Depression, guests were pouring into the revitalized town, putting Key West on the fast track towards recovery. Now, despite this fast track towards recovery, during this period, there was some more bad news. But this bad news wouldn't dissuade the trajectory of the Keys, at least. To start with this bad news, there was a hurricane in 1935 that occurred on Labor Day and is now famous as the 1935 Labor Day Hurricane. And this hurricane ripped through the Keys, destroying the town of Isle Morada, ripping apart Tavernier and Marathon, and destroyed portions of the Florida East Coast Railway extension that connected the railway to Key West. After a quick evaluation, it was determined that it wasn't fiscally responsible to restore the railway, giving it wasn't yielding the anticipated revenue in the first place. And so the company in charge of the railway sold what remained of it to the state of Florida, which instead of opting to rebuild the railway, decided to extend US Route 1 further south, building the today famous Overseas Highway, closely following the original path taken by the railroad. Now, it's worth noting that this drama with the railroad didn't really harm the economic recovery of Key West, and the revitalization efforts continued to work. To this day, despite no longer being continuous, some of these old tracks still stand, though, as bridges that are protected under the National Register of Historic Places, and you can go walk on them yourself if you want. Now, in addition to this bad news that was the railroad getting destroyed and having to be replaced by a road, which I think today people would consider mostly good news, there was another slightly happier event that happened in the 1930s, or at least that's what is thought. Though unconfirmed, it's thought that a special sort of pie made from a combination of condensed milk and citrus might have made its way to Key West. And that recipe that graced the shores of Key West in the 1930s is key lime pie. Now, if you do some sleuthing, you can find similar recipes in the past that date back to a lemon pie that was made in New York City, but it's thought that around the 1930s and 1940s, people in Key West started making this pie and swapping out Key West's sweet tart limes in place of lemons in the recipe from New York, eventually coming up with this world famous recipe. Now, there are some reports that this recipe actually dates back to the 1890s and could be attributed to someone known as Aunt Sally, who made the pies in Key West's Curry Mansion, but this claim isn't verifiable. Anyways, I just thought this would be a fun tidbit to toss into this video. Leading into the 1940s too, it's worth a quick discussion of Key West's role in the military, as I haven't discussed this much since we talked about the Civil War. At this point, Key West remained important militarily and played a pivotal role in a few conflicts, such as that between Spain and Cuba during the Ten Years' War, where the Atlantic American fleet was stationed in Key West to protect the American interest in Cuba. Following this, during World War I in 1917, a submarine base was established in Key West to prevent German ships from reaching Mexican oil, because if you remember, a military alliance was proposed between the Germans and the Mexicans in 1917, proposing to help the Mexicans recover much of the southwestern USA. The naval station during this time even became the headquarters of the USA's 7th Naval District, which covered the whole state of Florida, and the base even got an airstrip with seaplanes and blimps. And all of this leads into the 1940s when Key West also played a role during World War II. During this conflict, German U-boats had sunk cargo and military vessels in the areas around Key West. And in response, the USA set up the Fleet Sonar School, an underwater weapons development program in the area. 
Additionally, in World War II, Key West played a pivotal role, harboring more than 14,000 ships during the war, with the population sometimes doubling or tripling due to all the visiting sailors. And this military presence contributed to Key West having a notable guest following the war too, when President Truman himself, recovering from a cold, decided he needed to go somewhere warm for a while, and decided to stay at the Key West Naval Station, and notably stayed a total of 175 days on the island while taking work vacations between 1946 and 1952. He actually stayed so long that the residence he stayed in was eventually referred to as the Little White House. In addition to Truman, Dwight D. Eisenhower also paid a visit to the Little White House after he had a heart attack in office in the 1950s, visiting the spot to recover. And in the 1950s, something else happened. See, during the 1959 Cuban Revolution, there were once again an abundance of Cubans fleeing from Havana to the United States through Key West, taking ferries and airplanes to get there. But they didn't come alone. As they fled, they brought chickens with them in droves, apparently bringing them to the Keys and letting them run free, eventually spawning today's iconic Key West chickens. Now going to present day briefly, these chickens, if you're not aware, essentially roam the island freely, pooping everywhere they please, trespassing and cuckooing at all hours of the night. On one hand, they're a novelty and they eat insects around the island, and in the past they were also a valuable source of meat and eggs. But on the other hand, locals sort of hate them apparently because they're loud. Now over the years, there have been various plans proposed to deal with these chickens, but clearly none of them have worked as you can still find these chickens on essentially any live stream or any other video of the island that you look up, for instance. Moving on to a more serious topic than chickens though, the island was about to be involved in yet another military conflict in the 1960s that was spurred on by Fidel Castro's control of Cuba in January of 1959, the same event that brought all those dang chickens. In October of 1962, a USA spy plane took 900 photos of Cuba finding that there were military constructions identified later as Soviet ballistic missiles on Cuba. And overnight, just about a week after these photos were taken, the military took over Key West, covering it with barbed wire, mounting turrets on it, and positioning missiles throughout the island on the beaches. The army had even taken over local Casa Marina Hotel, using it as a command center if war broke out. In total, 15,000 military individuals came to the island, over the coming days, a bit of blood was shed, and there were even a couple of small skirmishes, such as with the US Navy ships forcing a Soviet submarine to surface. But eventually, both sides backed down in this conflict, and the Soviet Union pulled its missiles out of Cuba in exchange for the USA agreeing not to attack Cuba. Following the conflict, John F. Kennedy himself actually visited Key West, in part to inspect the missile systems, but also to reinforce the idea to Americans that it was indeed safe to travel to Florida and the Keys, places that, as we know, were very popular vacation spots. Following the missile crisis in 1974, the military presence in Key West was left behind though, with the Department of Defense closing down the station as part of a post-Vietnam war force reduction, although part of it still remains under the control of the Navy as a Navy air station on the island. The other parts of it have been made into a state park managed by the state of Florida, and Truman's Little White House on the island that's near the base has been preserved as a museum. The rest of the base is civilian controlled these days and has been redeveloped by civilians all over the island. Also in the 70s, alongside the decline of the military in the region, the fishing and shrimping industries on the island left for more economically feasible coastal areas. But in their place, more artists of all varieties began making their way to the island, in part with hopes of stimulating tourism in the area. One famous artist that actually spent some time there that you might have heard of is Jimmy Buffett. Now, according to Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville itself, Buffett arrived in Key West in 1971 with some friends in November of that year trying to escape Nashville's cold weather, which to be frank, as a Nashville native relocated to Michigan, I'm laughing at right now. Jimmy had just gone through a divorce and his friends wanted to get him on the up and up, and sure enough, Key West did the trick, inspiring him to become the famous singer, songwriter, and pop culture icon that he became. Additionally, Key West had its first Fantasy Fest in 1979. This multi-thousand tourist attracting festival brings in millions of dollars a year to the Keys and features floats made for the parade in its own Mardi Gras-like or Brazilian Carnival-like experience. 
This event to this day occurs around Halloween time, usually on Key West's famous Duval Street, and, well, let's just say it's not very kid-friendly. While being unclothed in public on Key West is generally illegal, there's a special zone around the Fantasy Fest area where for a couple of days on the island, nudity is allowed. Because of this, it's not unusual for folks to walk around in public in the bear during this event. The festival also holds multiple other events, a few of which are the Goombe, or a two-day street party held in Bahama Village, in which goatskin drums are played and the heritage of Key West's Bahamian population is celebrated, and also a more family-friendly bike ride called the Zombie Bike Ride, and a pet masquerade where folks dress up their pets among a handful of other events during Fantasy Fest. Generally, to sum up the 70s in Key West, the 70s were a time when Key West went from a normal vacation destination to a place where people who felt unwelcome elsewhere could mingle together and be themselves, or generally, it just became an offbeat destination. Additionally, it's worth noting that around this time is when the city became a haven for Florida's LGBTQ community. All of this growth and festivity blossomed too, just in time for the US Border Patrol to try and mess it all up in 1982. In 1982, the USA Border Patrol set up a fateful roadblock to inspect every passenger of every car and to search for illegal immigrants and narcotics in the cars on US-1 just north of where Miami-Dade and Monroe County met. And this road just happened to be the only one that you can get to the Keys on from mainland Florida. In response to this, Key West local government remarked over and over again that this was going to hurt the island's tourism industry because inevitably this would result in hours of extra traffic on the trip back to mainland Florida. But the federal government seemingly ignored their pleas to end the roadblock, so the city, as a form of a protest, declared Key West's independence, and that it would from then on be called the Conk Republic on April 23rd of 1982. The city claimed that because the federal government had essentially set up a border as if they were a foreign nation, that they might as well just be one, and began referring to their citizens as conks. They even went as far as jokingly declaring war on the United States by, on TV, breaking a loaf of stale Cuban bread over the head of a man dressed in a naval uniform. They also referred to themselves as the world's first fifth world country, and that they existed as a state of mind, hoping to bring warmth, humor, and respect to a planet needing all three. Their slogan was, We seceded where others failed, and stated that all of Key West residents were now dual citizens of both the USA and the Conk Republic. Luckily, this ploy, despite the joke that it was, actually worked and brought enough publicity to the Key's frustration with the roadblocks that they were quickly dispatched, but the name, the Conk Republic, would stick. And even to this day, it's hard to take a trip to the Keys without seeing some references to this event. This name and the joke of secession actually returned a few times too, such as in September of 1995 when the US Army conducted a simulated invasion of an island exercise at Key West without notifying the locals. In response to this event, once again, the Conk Republic surfaced. Additionally, during a 1995 to 1996 government shutdown, the Conk Republic sent out a joke Navy ship to the Dry Tortugas National Park to reopen it. Generally, the Conk Republic is a satirical country with a navy that is established in Key West that has a habit of reappearing when it thinks Big Brother's actions are laughably stupid, often getting itself or its citizens in trouble when the Conk Republic rears its head. Now, in addition to the Conk Republic antics, the 1980s were a time when Key West really leaned into its redevelopment as a tourist destination. In addition to this, more presidents, Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, were added to the list of presidents to work from the Little White House. Additionally, the now popular Old Town Trolley was set up to give tours of the city, and cruise ships started showing up at the island in 1984, when its cruise ship port opened off of its famous Mallory Square. There are also accounts that this is around the time that Key West started feeling like it does today, with Duval Street being crowded and rowdy on warm evenings. Admittedly, many of these accounts I found are by disgruntled individuals on forums that are generally unhappy with the state of the island, remembering simpler times when they could visit their favorite tropical island in relative peace and for half the price. And this sort of leaves us at the these days portion of this miniature documentary on Key West. 
Since then, there have been a few hurricanes, such as Hurricane of Georgia's in 1998 and 2017's Hurricane Irma, which both resulted in some flooding and property damage, but generally there have been no notable changes and Key West remains similar to what it was in the 80s, a tourist destination for those seeking a tropical island, but also a place that's a bit of a haven, where people that feel unwelcome elsewhere can be themselves happily and freely. Folks still flock here to enjoy their wilder side, to sit by the beach, and to watch chickens and six-toed cats frolic around the streets at night. Additionally, they love the cool bars, the plentiful art, and the terrific key lime pie sported by the island, as well as its abundant access to water sports in the ocean. With that, I hope you've learned a bunch about Key West history, but I feel like I owe you a little bit more here. How can I talk about Key West without talking about its weather, demographics, and future challenges? In short, what is Key West and where is it going in the future? Now, regarding weather and demographics, as we've said, Key West is the southernmost island that's part of a chain of islands known as the Florida Keys. The Florida Keys are coral key archipelagos, or a group of islands made from dead coral and other organic material, and they're fairly small and they're fairly low elevation. That elevation is only about 18 feet, making the Keys extremely susceptible to flooding, which will be a theme throughout the rest of this video. Now, while this island is fairly prominent in terms of its cultural relevance, it's small, being only about four miles in length and one in width. It's also positioned about 130 miles south of Miami and only about 95 miles north of Cuba. In the modern day, perhaps one of the most attractive aspects of Key West and one of the reasons people visit it is its climate, which is a tropical savanna similar to many other Caribbean islands. And this climate offers Key West a bit of consistency in terms of temperature throughout the year, with its average monthly temperature only fluctuating about 15 degrees Fahrenheit or 8.3 degrees Celsius. The weather here is actually so consistently warm that the record low temperature is about 41 degrees Fahrenheit, which is warmer than it currently is where I'm living, which makes me rethink my life choices a bit. It doesn't get too scorching hot here either in the summers because the prevailing meteorology here means that temperatures scarcely get to about 95 degrees Fahrenheit or about 35 degrees Celsius, with summertime lows hovering around 80 Fahrenheit or 27 Celsius. I think you'd actually be surprised to hear that the all-time record high temperature in Key West is actually only 97 degrees Fahrenheit or 36 Celsius, which I regularly saw surpassed during my time living in Massachusetts. Now, what won't surprise you, I think, is the fact that like most other tropical places, Key West isn't always dry. Rather, sometimes, specifically between May and October, rain falls here on most days, and it's typically a downpour, as you'd expect if you've ever lived in Florida or the general region of Florida during the summer. Additionally, there are quite a few hurricanes that hit the region, and as you'd expect from an island at only about 18 feet of elevation, they hit Key West pretty hard. Although lucky for Key West, in recent history, it hasn't been hit too badly, with the most recent hurricane hitting the island being 2017's Category 4 Irma, and before that, Wilma in 2005, when the whole island had to be evacuated, and nearly three feet of water covered much of the island, destroying cars, properties, and piers. Regarding population, there are about 25,000 people in Key West as of the 2000 census, and keep in mind that these people reside on just a 4 by 1 mile island, putting the population density of the island actually quite comparable to that of Atlanta, Georgia, weirdly enough. And weirdly, when you think of tropical paradise, you'd think that folks living here might be pretty wealthy, or at least above the USA median household income of about $75,000. But in reality, the median household income in 2000 was $43,021, or in today's money, about $78,000. And the median income today is about $73,000, which means not only are folks on the island often making less than the middling salary in the USA, their salaries also aren't keeping up with inflation, although that should hardly surprise any of us that are salaried employees these days. If you look up what folks do in Key West, you'll also find that the majority of folks in the city, or about 4,000 of the residents, work in hospitality, and after this, about 1,000 work in retail, healthcare, and government and construction, gradually tapering off as you go towards other disciplines. And for this next portion, I don't want to get political, but to be frank, we're going to talk about how climate change is going to impact the Keys. And you're welcome to comment on your misgivings, but I'm not going to respond to any climate change-related comments. 
I'm simply stating what scientific intrigue suggests will be occurring at Key West in the near future. Now, as I've stated multiple times, the Keys are low-lying islands. And previously, they've been underwater during interglacial periods, when water covered the areas and the sediment and coral that formed them over time became sandbars, which poked out from under the water. Now, just as the Keys poked out of the waters as the waters receded, with climate change causing water levels to rise globally, it's anticipated that the Keys might face an existential threat to their long-term habitability, with folks anticipating that the sea level will rise on these islands by one to seven feet, or about one half to two meters by the year 2100. Let's keep in mind that the highest points on the Keys are at about 18 feet above sea level, and it's clear that while not all of Key West will be permanently underwater at this point, that some of it will be, and what remains will be far less resilient to future flooding storms and tidal action in general. Additionally, with the propensity for real estate on the island to flood and get damaged by hurricanes increasing day by day, while it's not a sexy topic, insurance costs are something that needs to be considered. Residents of the Florida Keys are facing rising insurance costs, and these insurance increases are so significant that most major news outlets have actually reported on them. For instance, many Keys residents are reporting nearly $10,000 of coverage per year is required to cover disaster insurance alone, making some properties virtually uninsurable. It's not fun to talk about, but it's the truth. Unless we figure something out, life in the Keys, at least at the very least, is going to become more expensive in the future. And if we don't act proactively, it might not even be plausible at all in the long term. Additionally, it's worth noting that with more severe extreme heat events, harsher winds, and generally higher electricity and natural gas demand being caused by the aforementioned extreme heat, the problem of rising sea level is just one of the many challenges that the Keys will have to face, making me wonder about its long-term feasibility as a place where people live and vacation to. But that's enough talk about disaster. I think that's about everything I wanted to talk about. So with all of that in mind, I think I'll bid you adieu. Sorry I couldn't end this video on a happier topic, it just seems that in a video where we move from the past towards the present, that the future and the possible problems facing a place I'm talking about is the logical place to end. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope that at some point you're able to pay a visit to this eclectic, eccentric, and at least for now, tropical paradise. Now, if you liked this video, or really just this sort of thing, you know, history, and sometimes history with a touch of the spooky, I encourage you to subscribe because there's going to be a lot more of it. If you're inclined, I'd also appreciate it if you commented and liked this video, as it helps tell YouTube that this little channel doesn't suck too much. Anyways, I hope you had a bit of fun on this little journey to the tropical island of Key West. And with that, don't you ever forget, even if you're sitting on the beach, it's always story time.